Good afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about the persistence of Norway rat populations in Alameda County in relation to homeless encampments. Well, in Alameda County, our basic operating procedure is to make requests for services from the public. We get about six to 7,000 requests for services each year from the public, and they're assigned based on geographic area. So when we have something like a homeless camp situation like we've had for the last several years, uh, this does take a lot of resources away from our general you know, requests for services. And staff have other assigned type of projects that they're working on. So here's our basic problem. We have endemic Norway rats in our sanitary sewers. You know, they've been there forever practically. And just them being in the sewers wouldn't be a problem, but there are ways for them to get out. And the lack of sanitation in and around homeless encampments, there's just food all over. People are give, delivering food, the homeless get food, you know, they eat what they can, what's fresh, and then they throw the rest out, usually on the ground, usually ends up in a pile, and it's a ready fodder for our local Norway rats. And probably the, the biggest thing that's bothering probably everybody is the failure to resolve the issues that allow the creation and continued existence of homeless encampments. So we're basically talking about the Norway rat, <clears throat> commonly known as the sewer rat or brown rat, introduced from China. It's a pest species worldwide, commonly found in association with human and most prevalent in highly urbanized areas like the city of Oakland, and the Norway rats are generally larger in size than the roof rats, the ratus ratus, and are good swimmers and excavate extensive burrowing systems. Norway rats are host to ectoparasites, specifically fleas, lice, and mites. So here's a, a look at our rodent request for services from 19, you know, 2006 to 2021. And if you kind of look back at 2006 through 2014, these are just kind of went up and down a little bit and weren't really wasn't anything significantly different through this time frame. But come around 2014, when the first ban for uh, second generation anticoagulant baits uh, went into effect and removed decon, you know, the kind of, you know, standard control that most of the public use to control rats around their home, our requests started going up for, for rats. And it, it, it hasn't really got, gone down. And you know what we were hearing from the public, what they're buying at the, at the local stores, just wasn't controlling the rats like you know, the second generation that they used to have access to. So if you kind of look at this, you know, they have this blue bar, you see, kind of on, on the left is in, unclassified rats. These were just when rat, rat requests for services come in, unless the public tells us specifically what rat they think it is, it comes in as, it's just as rats. And over the years, we, you know, hadn't, you know, really, you know, forced the, the staff to Go ahead and make sure that they change this to either Norway rat or roof rat or, or wood rat, uh, you know, or Tanazumi rats. So it kind of was a holding place for some of the rat requests for services. But in the last few years, we have been focusing on, you know, making sure we identify the rats and get them in our database. So roof rats, the kind of turquoise bar, as you could see, once we started getting rid of the uh, unclassified, we started, you know, most, the bulk of the rats, you know, requests for services are certainly roof rats. And their requests have been going up over, over the years. And then, you know, the house mice, they kind of vary a little bit, so it's kind of green, green bar. And, uh, you know, depending on the ecological conditions, that seems to be the main driver for, for their requests, you know, they just kind of go back and forth. But the orange bar, the Norway rat requests, you know, we 
thought we kind of had control of them. So we got a, a next slide here. We can look close, more closely at the Norway rat request for services. So we have this sewer baiting program that we've been uh, working on for, you know, ever since I've been here. And we pretty much thought we had the Norway rats in check. Norway rats in general are fairly easy to control above ground. You know, you, you see where their burrows are, you, you know where they are. They're not cryptic like the uh, the roof rats. You know, you just don't know where they are. And we kind of have a good idea what Norway rats like to eat. But again, you know, starting, you know, pretty much in 2014 or so, we started had this <clears throat> greater increase of them. And many of these, this is, much of this increase was due to the homeless camps in 2016, 2017, and to date. Uh, the data here, you know, in, in 2021, that's only till November here. So it's not quite complete yet. Well, here's an illustration of the problem. We have an older decaying sewer system throughout the Bay Area and specifically in Oakland and some of our older cities, Berkeley, Hayward, you know, in San Leandro, the old sewer lines, especially the sewer laterals, they're made out of terracotta. It's kind of easy to break if there's some shifting. And we've had several earthquakes in our area and we seem to have them on a somewhat regular basis. But if there's cracks, breaks, breaches in, in these sewer laterals, the normal rats can get out, you know. So they're foraging up and down the sewer laterals, finding what comes out maybe hopefully from our our uh, garbage disposals and the like but there's a lot of other waste that go down there and also if there's uncapped open sewer lines you know the rats get out and when they get out if they find more resources like piled up garbage and stuff with a lot of food around homeless encampments and other areas this is when they start building up populations adjacent to the breaks and cracks. Some cities require when these breaks are detected, they require them to be repaired, you know, kind of on a expeditious basis. But in the city of Oakland, they don't always require, require it. We find breaks, notify the property owner and the city, and if the property owner could afford it or feels like it's a convenient thing to do they'll they'll have them repaired so old aging sewer system with lots of rats living in there so we have an oakland targeted sewer bait based norway rat control project and back in 1988 the city of oakland passed a, a, an assessment for us it's a dollar 28 per per housing unit and, and it really isn't a, enough money to cover our control program, but we, we subsidize it and we spend a lot of time going out, staff go out every week and do sewer manhole inspections. And they also bait them when they see signs of, of Norway rat activity. So in 2020, a total of 8,109 sewer inspections were made. The sewers that had active rat activity totaled 2,172. And we are using right now contract eight ounce super blocks from a dialogue. And we use 1,088.25 pounds of the contract. Uh, I might mention right here, you know, because of uh, the recent uh, ban of second generation anticoagulant baits in California, there is an exemption for vector control but you know what? This kind of dried up the market and we're having a hard time getting contract super blocks, which you know, have been working well and pretty convenient for our purposes. So we're still trying to make orders for it, but it might be a, a, a tough thing to get in this state anymore. So this is what we see when we look down the sewer manholes, you know, you don't always see a, a dead rat, but if you see these rat droppings, you know, the kind of fresh dark ones, you know, give you an you know, indication that these are relatively new droppings. These kind of faded out ones have been sitting around for a while. So this is how we suspend the bait on this aluminum wire 
down just above the, the, the bottom of the platform of the sewer manhole. You know, very convenient for the, the rats to, to get at and eat. So besides the sewer baiting program, we also, especially when we get residential requests for services and it looks like it's a Norway rat activity, we might see a burrow or not. So we do smoke tests. So this is non-toxic smoke that's uh, pumped down into the, under pressure into the sewer lines. We have to notify all the residents and the fire department that we're, we're doing this because, you know, people see smoke coming out of places around their house. We don't want them to th think it's on fire. And, but this smoke is very penetrative and it, you're able to find breaks fairly easily, or at least get near where breaks are. So our staff go out, so we usually need a team of like four or five or more people when we're doing a smoke test and where we see smoke going out, we mark it with this with this spray chalk, you know, it, it could be easily washed off so we're not tagging people's driveways and, and property permanently. And you could see the smoke coming out. A situation like this, you know, the, obviously or apparently the the breach in the sewer line is underneath this concrete. This is kind of a problem because in the city of Oakland, uh, residents are re responsible or property owners are responsible for the repair of sewers to where they connect to the sewer line. So that lateral, if it needs to be replaced, often you have to dig up the, the road and everything. So it's kind of expensive. And I think this is one reason that the city doesn't uh, always require these sewer lines to be repaired. When you're selling your home, that's when you know they are required to be repaired. But a lot of homeowners go ahead and have them repaired because they don't want rats coming out and hanging around their yard and their neighbors complaining that they're letting some problem just go on and on. So uh, another way we try to find you know breaks in the sewer line is doing dye tests. You know, a lot of times we'll find a burrow. We're not sure if it's just in the ground or it could be related to the sewer line. So we put these powerful dyes down into the sewer or down into to the opening. We you know, flush it out with water and let it run for a little bit. Then we go to this local sewer access opening that's downstream and look in. And if we see the dye, there's a clear sign that there's a breach in the sewer line or that rat burrow leads directly to the sewer. So kind of back to the homeless. So every two years, there's supposed to be a homeless census. So if you look over here on the right-hand side of the screen, there's the Alameda County Census of 2017. Countywide, we had 5,629 homeless folks were identified. The majority is always in Oakland. It's our, our largest city. And uh, also there's a lot of resources for people living on the streets. So, and then come over here to 2019, you know, there were 8,022 homeless detected or identified countywide. And if you kind of look at the, the little bar graph, you know, just below the, the header of, of these surveys, you know, it's just been steadily going up. You know, there was a little dip there in, in 2015, but whatever we're doing, we're getting, we're still getting more homeless on our streets. So this is kind of look at, at the city of Oakland where their homeless camps are located. Geez, you know, there's, <clears throat> Probably in 2017, there's like maybe 120 that that were identified throughout the city. Some are just one or two people. Others may have dozens of folks living there. And they're they're not all you know uh, you know rife with with rat problems. And it kind of depends on the location. But down in the flatland areas, that's the the domain of the Norway rat and the sewer system. Going up close up the hilly area. The rats don't seem to like to swim upstream in, in sewer, sewer mains, so it's not always in the hill area. So here we are at 2021. You know, the, the map didn't change a lot, except there seems to be a lot more homeless camps spread around. 
And part of the problem is, you know, if the city does abate or close down a homeless camp, not, not everybody takes the offered housing and they kind of spread out into other areas. And eventually this may lead to an increase in, in red activity and certainly uh, more uh, sanitation problems. <clears throat> so here's kind of the beginning of our formal uh, interaction with the city of Oakland for a couple of years before 2017, I've been going to this meeting with the city of Oakland, their Caltrans folks, you know, they were dealing with abating mainly uh, homeless camps on Caltrans property, but the city was pretty interested in that because when the city chased people, I mean, when the Caltrans chased people off their property, they go on to city property. And the other big thing that they're working on was the graffiti and vegetation management. But, you know, I was kind of putting a little bug in their ear about sanitation and, uh, you know, why don't you have porta potties and things like that. But, you know, it's often, you know, physical problems in these larger cities. They just don't always have the funds. So what happened here, this VA medical center, they were complaining to the city and they actually said they're going to move if the city didn't do something about these tents and stuff on the sidewalk. So their staff that work at the, the medical center and their clients, they couldn't get into <laughs> to their facility without walking on the streets. And they just, they, they've had enough with it. So that's when, you know, they, his, this guy, Joe, reached out to me and said, Dan, could you help us out? Because across the street from the tents was this this uh, strip of dirt, soil area, where they wanted to move the, the homeless folks over, you know, have them off the sidewalk in the end of this area. But the only problem was is there's been, had been dumping for a couple of years onto this property, and they had told them to put the stuff, you know, your leftover food and everything over there in the city, come by occasionally and, and clean it up. So, and there were rats over there and the homeless folks didn't want to move over to a rat infested area across the street. So uh, we said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll help with this. You know, it's you know part of our job and we thought it'd be good to you know, start working with the city on some of this. So. As you can see, there are all these rat burrows <clears throat> all over the place. And we did ask the city to remove as much of this uh, ivy that was kind of covering up the rat burrows. And technically, th this is actually Caltrans property. But back in the, the 70s, the uh, city you know, got an arrangement with Caltrans saying that the city wanted to manage these properties. Uh, they really regret it now, <laughs> but at the time it seemed like a, like a good idea. So, and then all around this area, there was just food dropped kind of willy nilly, and you know these and there was rat burrows right next to to the VA medical center. They did have pest control, so we kind of let them go on with their own pest control. And uh, this is another thing that we ran into. It's kind of makes our staff a little anxious when there's syringes all around in these areas. You know, we do wear safety safety boots and safety shoes, but you know, just the injectable drug use was just enormous in these areas. And what was even worse is if you look up here, that's a sharps container where these syringes were it was kind of down at the bottom of this this image. So they put a sharps container but you can't get them to, to use it. And the city does, and they have to hire kind of hazmat type folks to come out and pick up all these syringes and do what they call micro cleanings. And it, they spend big bucks, you know, doing this cleaning. And yeah, there's supposed to be a needle exchange program, but it kind of seems like a, a one way uh, trip with these. So the city did all this cleanup. You know, this is kind of amazing. You know, we never knew there was a sidewalk below all the ivy, but there one was. And 
And I just have to say, you know, the the tragedy of people living out on the streets like this, this guy, I'm just speculating because what I've been told, you know, he had some severe mental issues. They, they can't force people to seek help. And this guy refused all help. And about a year after this, he ended up dying from exposure, camping out. So, you know, so it's, it's pretty bad. So at, at this time, we were using uh, the uh, dye track, you know, dust, rodenticide dust to dust the burrows. It seemed like the sa safest thing to do because when the rats go back and forth through there, they get it on their fur, they go back to their burrows and, you know, hanging out during the day and grooming and thereby ingesting the, the dust. You know, the other option, which we're doing now, would be the, using the, the pellets pelleted rodenticide and there's always the potential of them being kicked out by the rats they didn't want extra stuff there maybe they had something better to eat but you know subsequently you know we we're informed by our ag department that we shouldn't be using it and they wouldn't give me give us an emergency use permit to use it around homeless camps especially if it wasn't near tents so uh, eventually they did say if the burrows were heading towards tents you know that we can can consider that a dwelling and that that also does help with the uh, the pellet baiting so the city started doing more and more you know we were really qu quite happy and i thought wow we're on on a, a good track now so they started to open up these navigation centers with tiny homes. They're developing more housing for the indigent, spending lots of money, you know, millions of dollars. And they increased the frequency of refuse removal. And that's one thing. So we started having regular meetings about homelessness after that. So I, uh, during the meetings, we're always bringing up, you know, can't you, you know, pick up the, the garbage more frequently or try containers and, you know, to, you know, to containerize it so rats can't get in, the portable toilets, hand wash stations. So they eventually slowly, as resources were available, you know, put out, you know, these portable toilets and hand wash stations. And these navigation centers, they do have pest control. So, you know, the, the city's trying, you know, with uh, limited resources. And, uh, well, we'll continue with the story. Let's see if we could get the slides to change. So, so this was the kind of the beginning of the navigation centers with the tiny homes, you know, they're putting them up. And we're all jazzed up about this, you know, because we, they were able to, you know, abate and close down homeless camps to do all the cleanup, you know, we do live trapping for disease surveillance and then we'd also do a, a rat population knockdown so the first big one you know and this took a lot of our effort was this Cat castle street navigation center it cost about three quarters of a million dollars and the, the idea was to get people in there invite them in they couldn't force them to go in and then have you know just an aggressive program to try to get them, you know, their life straightened out and get them into permanent housing. And it did close in, in 2019 at the end of the lease of the property. And pretty much at that time, it did solve the problem in this one area. All these blocks, you know, had people camping on it. I mean, there was just an incredible amount of Norway rats there. So while these people are all camping out there. There was one period of time where the the city was employees kind of, uh, I think they got an injunction. The union got an injunction against the city for having their public works employees uh, clean up these homeless camps. It wasn't the job that they were hired for. And they thought there was a lot of danger to it and you know all kinds of you know, refuse and things that they, they usually wouldn't be getting involved with. But eventually they settled with the union and the folks that had to do, the, you know, come out and do the cleanup. They got a, a special stipend for working, working at the homeless camps. 
So this is what it looked like here. And this is just one of the blocks, you know, this lot kind of behind there you know, to the left. That's where they put the navigation center. And it was just full of rats all around. I think we went through four or five uh, baiting forays through there, but plus all the, the live trapping. And during the live trapping, they did find Oreo into rat fleas. So we did do some dusting for ectoparasites in the burrows. But after this was all done and they built these tiny homes and the people moved in, I mean, we really felt like this is a success story. We could repeat it, you know, throughout the city and we'll, we'll have a solution to this. Nice ideal dreams, right? <laughs> So and another thing that they started was ha having these uh, you know, portable showers come by and the ones that they're using now have actually have laundry facilities. It's pretty expensive, you know, to to have these, but there's all these entrepreneurs out there, you know, ready to, to make a buck and it really helps. You know, if you want folks to go out and look for a job and, and try to get into permanent housing, you know, they they have to be able to clean up and and so this so again, you know, we thought we were on a kind of a roll here, you know, abating these homeless camps. They move people out into navigation center. We go by and do live trapping and for disease surveillance and, and do a population knockdown. It's really helpful. So just to look, you know, some of the, the, the things that the city was working on. And we, we really thought we were on. And so even now, so this is, Slated to open up in a couple of weeks over by Lake Merritt, you know, the kind of the jewel uh, of the city. But there's people just keep camping, you know, all around the lake. There's this, all kinds of there's all these little parks all around there besides the main park. So these are pretty neat innovation. They're 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 designed to put up easily, and then you could remove them, take them somewhere else, and put them back up. And just to look inside, you know, they got electricity, they got heaters, you know, they just are gonna fold down cot, but designed to be easy to easy to clean and easy to remove and move somewhere else once their job is done. Rats. So the, the city, you know, they, they kind of got better and better in, in increasing the frequency of garbage collection. They tried all kinds of different stuff for containerization, putting out uh, dumpsters, which it looked just ended up attracting illegal dumping. And sometimes they pay the homeless to, you know, not say anything while they, people fill it up full of stuff. And then we found it wasn't even always being used. You know, they did put out the, you know, the garbage totes, and those weren't always used. So it's a, it's a difficult problem. You know. There's the people out camping out, they have a variety of issues from drug use to just mental problems and, and depression, you know, maybe big on the conditions they're living in. So this is what we run into at the, these homeless camps. You know, well-meaning people would come and, and drop off food, you know, and all these catering trays. The folks would eat it, but they wouldn't eat it all, you know, and what's left over, they're not going to go back and eat it, especially after it's set all night and let and the rats were feeding on it. And it just, there's just food, you know, all, all over the place. And if there's a, a breach in the, in the sanitary sewer or a residual Norway rat population nearby, it's amazing how fast their population in, increases. So constant food supply and harborage. So this is basically what was happening. You know, the city would put up these 72 hour notices and tell people to move your stuff, or it's gonna get thrown away. And the, they come in, you know, they just roll up a tent and everything's in it. They're not allowed to take anything because that would be, you know, like you're just kind of stealing people's stuff, but they gave them notice to either move it or it's gonna be tossed. And so this is, Typically, what happened? So they did the cleanup on April 13, 2017, and everything, boy, it's just amazing. Everything was all cleaned up. The power washed the sidewalk. But by the 19th, people were back, moved in here, and uh, 
and that's been the ongoing problem. They abate some place, say they can't camp there, and people move back, and they don't seem to have a mechanism to prevent that. Um, you know, the kinder, gentler government. So, and this is kind of what started happening around the same time, you know, so the city would put up these notices on the left, you know, that they're going to come and clean up. And then, you know, we come by and we do trapping afterwards. Well, what happened, you know, they starting around this time, ACLU was suing Caltrans and they were suing the city of Oakland. They didn't sue us, but we did get a subpoena, you know, for, for records and, we didn't really ha have a lot, you know, related to to Caltrans. But all this property here were just a, a butts, you know, the homeless camp, a butts to it is Caltrans property. And before the city got into their agreement with them, <clears throat> Caltrans was responsible for uh, maintenance of, of all the property. <clears throat> now the city, you know, has accepted that. So. What we started running into legal impediments to the ending of unmanaged encampments, and part of this was based on this uh, Martin versus Boise decision. The ruling held that cities cannot enforce anti-camping ordinances if they do not have enough homeless shelter beds available for their homeless population, and also homeless advocates and their often spurious lawsuits and injunctions against the city. I mean, there was injunctions that they couldn't do cleanup at encampments. And one, you know, this uh, Union Point encampment right along the, the estuary, they, the city wasn't allowed to clean up for three months. The rat problem, problem was ridiculous down there. And then also there's uh, the lack of political will to protect the city residents, taxpayers, and homeless from the deplorable conditions caused by unmanaged camping and refuse accumulation. So, all these things work together to just kind of stymie, you know, any, any significant change. Though I must say the city changed the procedure to comply with the Boise decision. So if they are going to close down an encampment, often because of the neighbors that are complaining and the, the rat activity and illegal activity and stuff, the city does make sure they have enough, you know, housing for these folks but i mean you'd be surprised you would think that they want to go to some place you know and 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 live inside no they very few people were taking up these offers so here's kind of an example of what this kind of revolving circle of cleanup and abatement and trapping and and baiting is so this is what we affectionately call our Home Depot encampment you know, by High Street and, and Oakland. I mean, it's a big old encampment. This one even made it to the, the, the New York Times. But it's, it, I mean, it, it, it's just a giant encampment, a lot of rat activity. And so did a cleanup and an actual closure back in, in February of 2020. And so Back in March of 2021, look at that, everybody's back. And part of the reason, you know, that they let them come back is was COVID-19 and some CDC uh, guidance on not to disturb homeless camps. So all that work, you know, was, was to no avail. And they, they did a partial closure here mainly because they, this, these, there's like three lots here in front of us. On the right is one owned by Caltrans, the one kind of in the middle by this, you know, silver SUV is owned by uh, the city and they want to put a roadway, uh, complete a roadway project going through there. And then on the left is a private lot and the, the owner just kind of gave up on any responsibility of doing anything because he, he just has no control over it. You put you put up a fence, the fence get cut, cut through. So anyway, after all that work, they're back. And after this cleanup, they kind of force people to just park along the main streets called Alameda Avenue. And right behind here is Home Depot. And 
they've been threatening to leave because of the situation. So we have this vicious circle of, of cleanup and you know a, a abatement and just more stuff being piled up. So this is Union Point Park. This is actually one of the few success stories, mainly because the city was going to be fined six thousand dollars a day by the Coastal Commission because they're only leasing the property for this park and the estuary is right behind it. But the rat problem was horrendous. And then also uh, there was a historical building here that was burnt down uh, by the homeless. And that was, you know, that's another bad component. So almost, I think in 2020, about two times a day, there would be fires at homeless encampments in the city of Oakland. It's just, it's just crazy. So this is a, another location in the city of Oakland, but this is actually county property. And this is by the Oakland Coliseum. There's the railroad tracks there. So we had involvement with this, the uh, Union Pacific Poli you know, Railroad Police and the county sheriffs. And you'd be amazed. I think they took like 20 or 30 stolen cars out of here. They come driving down the railroad tracks and it was a, a kind of a lawless area for quite a while. While they were doing this uh, abatement, and with the sheriff there and the Union City Police, some guy came riding down the railroad tracks with a stolen car. He got caught. But yeah, they just there was just food all over, and the the, the problem that the county was running into is the flood control district. Is this stuff you know can't go into the flood control channel, and it was, and so they're warned that you know you could get that $6,000 a, a day fine, or and it can't even be more. So the county took it very seriously and evaded this encampment. And as far as I could tell, you know, this one's still abated. The county has a, a different approach. And, uh, but this is what we're seeing. If you, at the time of this encampment here, if you came off the 980 freeway, you'd come right into this encampment. It's like going into another world. And, you know, if you're not used to this, it could pretty much shock you. And this is what we find out, find all around these encampments. People, good, well-meaning people <clears throat> just dropping off food. You know, they'll just drop it on the ground. I really don't think the homeless folks are going to pick up food off the ground and, and eat it. So well-meaning, but it ends up being food. So our basic protocol, you know, we look for signs of rat activity, the droppings, paw prints. You know, you got the paw prints there and then some little burrowing and, you know, dirt being kicked out. So it's usually pretty obvious. And then we set out these live traps to catch the Norway rats and our staff try to find kind of concealed places to put the traps you know a lot of these encampments there's a lot of places to tuck these things away we have had traps stolen had traps destroyed we've had rats mutilated in the, in the traps so you know we pretty much have to be careful and we do try to talk to people when they're out there they look at look at us as the good guys out there trying to reduce the rat population but you know it, it's a real challenge you know really rats <clears throat> so here to our rat trapping and disease surveillance <clears throat> excuse me so <clears throat> our staff goes out you know d depending on the, the situation you know we have to evaluate the encampment to make sure the, the folks are going to be okay with us trapping there. I mean, there's some not so nice people around. So, but what we use in the, in the traps is a combination of mackerel and peanut butter. I, I never had that sandwich, but I bet you I really don't want to have it. <laughs> but but and the, the, the mackerel is something the Norway rats really like. And it's something that they don't generally find at the encampments and the peanut butter is kind of there for, for dessert. So uh, the traps are le left out overnight. We generally put out from 20 to 40 traps, maybe 30, depending on the encampment and the available of, of, of traps. And they pick them up the next morning. 
uh, Norway rats are brought back alive <clears throat> and then euthanized and then <clears throat> blooded ectoparasites are removed and then tested for pathogens. So here's a happy staff. You know, this time we're, we're out in the city of Berkeley, but so this is under Highway 80. And as you can see, the sign, state property, no dumping, no parking, no trespassing, but the homeless residents there, they just cut a hole in the fence and they use it as a, a gate. They, I think they close it and secure it with some wire at night to keep other people out. But we're here with our some, our Berkeley counterparts uh, strapping, picking up the rats. So this is the the Union Point encampment that just got so so real crazy. I mean, if you give people time, look in the back. That's a structure made out of the insulation. You know, the the insulation boards all taped together. You got like a little palace there, just a waterfront home. But this was a beautiful park, you know, over a million dollars worth of damage that had been done to it. And this is one of our successes. It is it has been closed to uh, to homeless camps and, uh, you, know, it, you know, most likely due to the, uh, the threat of being uh, fined $6,000 a day, the city has kept this clear of more future camping. And we are out again in the city of Berkeley, putting out traps. And this is generally what happens. So we, we kind of have to limit the amount of traps we put out so they're able to fit in the back of one of our, our, our pickup trucks. And people walking by, they look at this, they're pretty amazed that people are trapping rats and amazed that there are so many rats to be trapped. And a lot of people quite thankful that we're doing this. Again, you know, it's one of those strange things, you know, picking up these rat traps and, and putting them out. And sometimes it's a challenge to find the traps because people will move them. <clears throat> We've had them throw them into the estuary at all kinds of different stuff happened to the traps. And if we have to walk <clears throat> a little ways, we generally put them in these big plastic bags and, uh, you know, because rats are peeing and stuff. and it's really quite messy and then we turn back <clears throat> to the truck take them back to the office for test and just a, another look you know trying to you know because we put out flags you know for the locations of where we put the traps but a lot of stuff happens overnight people take the flags you know they take the traps and and it just was kind of amazing this guy had something like 40 motorcycles back here and who knows where they all came from? Yeah, like a motorcycle junkyard going. And you're always happy when you catch a couple rats. So again, go back to diseases uh, potentially vectored by rodents and homeless encampments, the soul virus, rat bite fever, leptospirosis, Bartonella, marine typhus, and uh, so it's not a good situation. And we would only seen stuff like this back when we had like a Loma Prieta earthquake and we had you know freeways falling down and a lot of the garbage collection uh, was halted. So, I mean, this is a man-made crisis, you know, so hopefully, you know, we could, we could. So <clears throat> these are the, the fleas found on the Rattus norvegicus. We generally find the cat flea, they're most, often found on there, but we also find oriental rat fleas and occasionally the northern rat flea. <clears throat> so with the cat flea, you know, the biggest concern in what we test for is flea-borne typhus. Uh, the oriental rat flea could be plague or murine typhus and the northern rat flea for plague. <clears throat> so rodent-borne diseases that we have in Alameda County, leptospirosis, rat bite fever, we still are doing surveillance for uh, soul, soul virus, a hantavirus, and uh, salmonellosis. <clears throat> salmonellosis. So just to look at the flea-borne typhus cycle, the urban cycle, Norway rats, and you know, Norway rats, fleas, and whoever's going to be the uh, 
the victim of this, usually humans. The s suburban cycle of possums and, and feral cats. And so you got the kitties and the opossums. And we've had, we have found Rickettsia felis in Alameda County, actually throughout the county, and it's not really related to homeless encampments, but you know, homeless camps certainly have special conditions where you're, you can certainly find find more, but it's ubiquitous. So, and certainly one source of fleas in Alameda County is Norway rats from homeless encampments. So that's where we do a whole lot of our, our trapping. I mean, we just, we, we just don't want to be surprised if there's an, a human case somewhere and the conditions are bad, you know, they look bad enough that it kind of behooves us to uh, <clears throat> stay on guard. So flea-borne rickettsia in California, we've found throughout the state, Orange County, LA, San Bernardino, Riverside, Sacramento County, and Contra Costa. So it's, it's out there. <clears throat> So just to kind of look at, you know, just, just uh, you know, kind of a snapshot <clears throat> findings in homeless encampments location here on 1st and 2nd and 23rd Street in Oakland. Out of 32 Norway rats, 27 had fleas, six pools from different rats were positive for rickettsia. And uh, one feral cat produced six pools, four of them were positive for Rickettsia felis. And similar out, out on Wood Street, you know, it's like wherever we trap, there's lots of fleas and there's always, well, not always. So here on the High Street in, encampment, we didn't find any Rickettsia felis at that trapping event. So <clears throat> surveillance. In 2019, we did, uh, we visited 15 different homeless camps for disease surveillance and the number of separate trapping events were 26. Total number of Norway rats trapped, 608. And the total number of fleas collected for disease surveillance were 646. So in 2020, we did a similar type thing, a number of different homeless camps surveyed, 16. Number of separate trapping events, 37. And the number of Norway rats trapped 626, and the total number of fleas collected 696. So, a lot, <clears throat> a lot of rats, a lot of fleas. So, and, and besides the trapping, we do do population knockdowns. We usually do this after the city does a, an extensive cleanup. That way, people are kind of moved away from the rat burrows. Sometimes you know they abated the camp and everybody is is totally gone, but that's not always the case. And part of it, you know, part of the Norway rat control at homeless camps, some places you just can't do it. You know, the tents are right on top of the rat burrows. It's just you know, yeah, it's just too risky. You know, and it's kind of risky already for them ha having you know rats running out of their tents and stuff, but. So anyway, the rat burrows baiting or dusting with rodenticide, we did stop the uh, <clears throat> the dye track, but generally with contract pellets and occasionally we have used fast track when something was urgent. And we've also been you know, trying the burrow RX fumigation device for rodent burrows. And this takes a lot of hours of staff time to, to do all this. So this is the products we're using. <clears throat> the Ditrac, you know, has difasinone. <clears throat> the bromodialone is found in the super blocks and, and the contract pellets. And the fast track contains bromethylene, which there's no antidote for. And that's why we really don't like to use it that much. I mean, if there's an unfortunate event, you know, there's possibility for, for Losing a, a life of somebody's pet, and hopefully no people. And then for the delta dust, dusting for ectoparasites, you know, it contains delta methrin. So right now, as I think I mentioned before, we're having a real hard time getting the contract super blocks, which are most convenient for baiting the sewers, 
and really help to, to knock down the, the rat population. It seems like because of the rodenticide bills, it kind of dried up the market in California for this product. And though we're still trying to get it because it's a lot easier to use because it's eight ounce. And that's pretty much what we've been baiting the sewers with. So if we had to use like the fast track, they got some fast track one ounce blocks <clears throat> labeled for use in the sewers, but you know you have to string up eight of those on to, to a wire and it's a little bit more messy and time consuming to solve it. So <clears throat> this is our staff when they're going out baiting, you know, they use these uh, tubes with the funnel hooked up and try to get, just get a couple ounces of the pellets in there. And it has to be six inches down below the surface and we cover up the burrows afterwards and certainly have to come back and pick up any uh, dead rat. So this is when we, the kind of good old days was only a few years ago when we were using the die track and just, you know, puffing a couple of shots inside the burrows and very effective. And we have to come back the next day for actually the next couple of days and survey for dead rats and pick them up and dispose them properly. So, and we have been using the Burrow RX. And so this is out at the uh, Coliseum complex where we had a lot of rat burrows along this flood control channel. So as you can see, you gotta cart this thing around. You have to have gasoline and you pump this into the burrows. You really need to try to identify, you know, the openings for, for the burrows. And it, it's not that easy to d determine, you know, if you've had positive results. So it's, it's a bit more cumbersome. And it certainly takes you know a, a lot of extra staff time, and you know we at when we were using it here, we did see you know some rats run out of the burrows, but whether we actually uh, eliminated any of them, it's it's not easy to tell. So again, <clears throat> this is one of the places where we we're pumping the carbon monoxide in there, and uh, we did see a rat come flying out. So they don't like the smell. And uh, if they have a chance, they'll try to get away from it. Here we have a look at our enormous homeless camp. This is on the west part of Oakland, actually at the borderline with Emeryville. This is what we call the Wood Street Encampment. This probably stretches at least for a mile. And if you look to the right, you know, there's, you see the freeway there. This Behind here is Caltrans property, property, Union Pacific property, and some private property. And there's people all over in this area. Uh, back behind here, there are chop shops where people, you know, you know, take stolen cars and remove, you know, the parts. And I, I assume and believe they're selling them. So at one time, you know, just several months ago, OPD told us that they were back there with Caltrans, High Patrol, and the sheriff, and they detected over 600 abandoned and stolen vehicles back there. So sometime in the future, this place is going to have to be cleared, and it is an amazing big project, and most of, the, of this has to be done by Caltrans. Here's an aerial view of our Wood Street encampment, courtesy of Google. This camp encampment extends almost a mile. And so if you see these pins here, the, the one in the middle is actually a safe parking place um, you know, made into this encampment. And it's you still got people you know, arbitrarily camping all around it. And over to the right, there is a organized navigation center and another safe parking spot. So this is gonna be really big project for Caltrans when they start closing it. So if you look kind of here on the left, by the end of the, this red area that I marked out, there's work, ongoing work by Caltrans. They're going step by step, working to the right. And eventually, somehow or another, they're going to be able to close this encampment. Uh, it's going to take quite a quite a while. The city of Oakland is quite anxious about this because where are the people going to go? 
and you know there is adequate housing you know but a lot of these people that are camping out here just don't want to go where the city of oakland is providing housing they, they like camping out you know it's a nice wild lifestyle in conclusion we have norway rats in our sanitary sewers and they're in not that great a condition and they could get out just them being in the sewers wouldn't be a real big problem if they stayed there. To date, we have not found any pathogens of concern at the homeless encampments. And uh, another, you know, kind of impediment is the Martin versus Boise decision, ruling that uh, you cannot close homeless encampments unless you offer housing to the homeless. The big problem is the housing that's being offered to the homeless, many of them don't want to go and actually there's a whole lot of folks that rather just camp outside we also have the homeless advocates and there are often spurious lawsuits and injunctions against the city that often you know halt cleanup and actually halt uh, getting folks relocated into uh, navigation centers and, and better housing at least off the streets and there is a lack of political will that are the leaders throughout the cities and actually our whole region and state of California really haven't wrestled with <clears throat> to stop homeless camps from growing and staying and becoming a, a blight on our cities and a threat to public health. I'd like to acknowledge all of our staff at Alameda County Vector Control that have assisted in our mission to prevent the spread of vector-borne disease at homeless encampments. They've done all the work and it's a dangerous area to work. You know, you saw the syringes, there's unsavory people, there's rats all over the place, and you never know what's piled up in the debris. So they, they've really met the challenge. And also the City of Oakland staff who have diligently tried to increase sanitation and provide more housing services and work with the unsheltered. You know, they're, they're a very good crew. I've met all these people and they're, they're just trying to, to solve the problem. And our Alameda County health care services for the homeless and behavioral health care that work with the unsheltered. So we have other parts of the county that are out there trying to, you know, help solve these problems. And the healthcare for the homeless, they go out to all these different homeless camps. And during the pandemic, they've been going out and doing, you know, uh, COVID-19 testing. So it's, it's a big crew all working together. And I hope someday we're able to stop and prevent this problem from on, being ongoing. Thank you for your attention.